All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I'll be reading the NASB 1995 translation. Uh, so here we go. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. So what we have here, right, Paul is beginning to kind of shift the subject of his correction. Um, as you know, the entire letter of 1 Corinthians is he's correcting the church at Corinth. And so he's changing the, the subject of his correction, and he's giving one little last thought as kind of a segue to a broader subject that we're going to get into later in this chapter. Um, and the subject is basically what it looks like to be a servant of Christ. And so over the last few months, from chapter 1, starting in verse 10, 1 verse 10, all the way through 323, the end of chapter 3, we've been looking at how Paul has been tearing down the habit of forming groups, cliques, factions based on certain teachers and certain leaders. As we know, Corinth is in Greece, and the Greeks um, loved philosophy, and they loved following particular philosophical teachers and leaders, people in the academy um, that was about 30 miles down the road from their town. And so, you know, they started doing the same thing when they had converged Christianity. They're like, well, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and so on and so on, right? And so Paul, for, um, like I said, from verse chapter 1, verse 10, all the way to the end of chapter 3, is saying, kind of keeping this main idea that we read in chapter 3, verse 19, he says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. So Paul is saying is, like, forming these factions and all this stuff and, and trying to follow, like, your favorite leader, your favorite teacher, your favorite pastor, whatever. He's saying even the wisest of men is a fool before God and his wisdom. And so Paul, knowing the Greeks' tendency to examine and evaluate teachers and thought leaders, uh, earlier in this letter, he said in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. He said, I kept it simple. We preach the gospel. Right? Right? Uh, Verses 4 and 5, chapter 2, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but the power of God. But the Greeks cannot help themselves, and oftentimes we cannot help ourselves, but to judge leaders and teachers based on certain factors, right? So uh, oftentimes it'll be the size of person's church, how well that person speaks, what they teach, the level of comfort in their teaching or the level of comfort in your particular church, the, doc the doctrinal leanings, right? Some of us, we, we hold firmly to certain positions and what we'll, we have this tendency of because, you know, so-and-so doesn't agree with me on this, this, and this, I refuse to listen to anything that they say. And so, this is what Paul is starting to address here in these first five verses. And so there's this tendency in humans, right, to get real nitpicky about the things that we're passionate about. And so one thing that we need to recognize is it's okay to be passionate and zealous about certain teachings. And there's certain things that are out of bounds, right, that we do not allow to be spoken from a pulpit. And there's certain things, you know, we'll call them non-salvific issues that we can disagree on and still call each other brothers and sisters, right? And so Paul is saying that being nitpicky, following these factions, forming these factions based on purely the teacher is not the way to go about things. 
um, he does give us two cases in which we can, um, I guess, draw a line in the sand, if you will. So Romans 16, 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. So the, the exceptions here, right? There are two exceptions, right? Everything else, I shouldn't say everything else, that's too inclusive, but almost everything else is being nitpicky. But there are two exceptions. One is false teachers, and two is someone who is living in sin. So here, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn. So anything that... Uh, deviates from scripture anything that deviates from the gospel turn away from them and in his letter to timothy chapter 5 verses 19 and 20 do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning okay so those are his two examples right he says if someone is a false teacher or if they are living in sin, then yes, at this point you can rebuke them. And he says, I'll, I'll pull it up again, rebuke them in the presence of all so that everyone is fearful of sinning, right? Which I wish would happen to more and more pastors, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so Paul being the great leader and teacher that he was, he didn't just write, okay, guys, now, you know, don't do that. Don't don't be too nitpicky. Don't judge. What he does is he gives us the way to go about things. He's always going to give us the correct way to look at things. And so in these first five verses of chapter four, Paul gives us a few major features or major characteristics of a minister. OK, and so normally when this passage of scripture is touched on, it will more often than not be directed towards pastors, church leaders, ministers, things like that. And so what we'll do is we'll make it uh, broadly applicable because everyone is a minister in some form or fashion, right? And then we, ha we do create distinctions between pastors and elders and then your run-of-the-mill Christian, right? And we'll get into that stuff a little later on. But Paul is giving us in these first uh, five verses— major features, major character characteristics of a minister. And so, starting in verse 1, let a man regard us in this manner. In what manner? As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So the first thing that we see, the first feature, the first characteristic of a minister is to be a servant of Christ. And I have this word underlined because we're going to take a, a take a closer look at this word servants. So the Greek word is hyperitos. Okay, hyperitos. Now what this is, is it's an underling or a servant. So being translated to English as servant is good. But what we need to understand is what kind of servant we're dealing with here. So properly, the literal uh, word hyperitos is a rower, a crewman on a boat an under rower who mans the oars on a lower deck. Figuratively, right, the, which is how it's being used, is a subordinate executing official orders, i.e. operating under specific or direct orders. And so what we need to first grasp is this word for servant is more slave-like than what we typically picture as servanthood, right? Um, so as you can see here, uh, in the, in the proper definition, the more literal definition, right? It's a crewman on a boat, an under rower. So this word comes from what they called the guys who rowed from the very bottom of what's a, a, a triremus, a tri, triremus. It's, it's a three-deck warship. So this is what it looks like, okay? This is a three-deck warship a tri, that were triremus. And so you'll notice that there are several decks, several levels of oars, right? And so who are the hyperitas? is that guy on the bottom right here, okay? And so when you think of yourself as a servant of Christ, that's, that's the picture that he wants us to have in our heads. Like, this is how low we are in our servanthood, right? And 
the bottom of the bottom, if you will. We're the bottom rowers. You got this guy, his head is like right next to that dude's bum. Like he is like down there, right? And this isn't, this isn't language exclusively used by Paul. Luke in his gospel refers to followers of Christ in the same word. You'll see servants, but it is a some form of hyperitas. In Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, slaves, underlings, bottom rowers, right? Jesus himself refers to his followers in this way. When he's standing before Pilate and Pilate is interrogating him in John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants, my hyperitas, would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So again, even Jesus himself is calling us these servants, these slave-like servants, bottom row. And so it's important that we understand this concept because if we can understand that we are slaves of Christ and that we're subordinate to his word, right? If, let's say, if the minister is to view himself as such, then all Christians, including ministers, view themselves as slaves of Christ, right? It requires this very humble approach, this very humble view. And so if you find yourself in a position of leadership or position of influence, then you need to remember that you are lower deck, right? Uh, Regardless of how, you know, talented you are or how gifted you are, knowledgeable you are, all these kinds of things, right? As Paul has kind of helped us understand in the earlier portions of the letter, right? This is all from the grace of God, right? We rely on the wisdom of God and all this stuff. So everything that we have has been gifted to us by God, ordained to us by God. And so it's very hard to fight the ego of man, right? And so um, oftentimes in a lot of churches and a lot of church settings, you know, people view being in ministry as like kind of like working your way up to something like, oh, I'm a youth leader or I'm on the worship team or I'm, you know, and this and that and this and that, you know. And some people, um, they hope to be in full-time ministry just to avoid having an actual job. It's a very, very, very dangerous mindset, you know? Because what we all need to understand, what we all need to grasp is that we're bottom deck, guys. We're, we're the lowest of the low. We are servants and slaves to Christ. And so it's also each person's responsibility to not prop up leaders and teachers to a place above the word of God. And that happens all the time, too. Uh, I alluded to it earlier, but we tend to, you know, because I disagree with so-and-so, I'm never going to listen to a word that they have to say. And yes, there are certain people you should mark and avoid entirely, but when we start to over-examine and over-nitpick certain things, it just kind of gets us into a lot of trouble. And and, it, and it, it helps us forget the level of humility that we should all have. So whether you do find yourself in ministry or in a position of leadership or influence or whether you view yourself as just a member of the church, we all need to stay humble. We all need to recognize that we are all slaves. We are all on the bottom deck and we're trying to row this boat along. And so... Because knowing and obeying scripture is how we serve God, this is where we find the will of God. So we don't sit and wait for God to speak to us. He has already spoken to us, and what he has spoken to us is sufficient. So again, when it comes to following teachers, right? So, okay, uh, in a more practical sense, if you're getting most of your study from watching sermons on YouTube than reading your actual Bible, you have a problem. Because what you're doing, right, is you're relying on the opinions and the study of other people and you are not diving into the word yourself. And so you could inadvertently, not saying this is an intentional thing, but it it, it does tend to happen, is you will place a, a person in authority over the word of God, right? Or let's say you don't watch YouTube sermons and you actually listen to your own pastor on Sundays. 
And if that's the only study that you're getting, then you need to fix that. You need to correct that. You need to dive into the Word and hold the Word of God as the authority over your life. Now, you can and probably should appreciate the time and the effort and the study that everyone puts in. But again, our primary source of influence and our primary authority is the Word of God. And God is gracious to us to give us leaders and teachers and pastors to help us understand uh, you know, certain concepts that we don't quite get. But, but we do not rely fully on them. We need to take the responsibility of learning the Word for ourselves. And again, because knowing and obeying Scripture is how we serve God. If we're going to call ourselves servants, slaves of Christ, we have to do the will of our Master. And where do we find the will of our Master? In the Word of God. And so we don't sit down in our little prayer time and go, all right, God, what do you want me to do today? He already told us what to do, right? He already told us what to do. I, you know, I think it's a bit, I want to sound mean. I don't mean this in a mean way, but sometimes I can't help it. I think it's a bit silly when we try to, um, when we ask God, God, you know, what school should I go to? God, should I take this job? Should I take that job? It's like, you know, and, and what I mean by this, all right, this is this is where I'll, I'll, I'll clear this up. What I mean by this is like, yes, we want to have some wisdom in, in our decision making, right? But this idea of what if God is calling me here, I choose here and miss out on all this stuff that God has for me. And to me, I think we're just like, yeah. Almighty God is like, oh no, they picked the wrong school. I can't use them now. Or I picked the wrong job, and so God can't do what he intended. Like, this is, we're talking about God here, right? And so, uh, with, and we have his word, we, ha we have what is expected of us, what is required of us. And so, I'll be very careful when I say this, but within the will of God, which is in scripture, and the wisdom of God, meaning the wisdom to kind of make decisions in our lives, do what you want, okay? And th what I mean by that is, obviously, you can't go continue sinning, right? Because that's outside of the will of God, and obviously, that is outside the wisdom of God, right? What are our parameters? Our parameters are the will of God and the wisdom of God. This wisdom that has been given to us by the Holy Spirit to grow up, be adults, make decisions, and, 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 and carry on in our lives, right? And to think that God is going to go, oh, no, wrong choice, whoops. Like, it's so silly, right? So this is not part of the message. This is just kind of like just between the will of God and the wisdom of God, right? There is all this liberty for you to, to live your life, right? And so... You need to get rid of this idea that the wrong choice will lead to like your life's destruction or missing out on the call of God. I, like that's so that's so bogus to think about God in such terms, right? You guys kind of tracking with what I'm saying here? You know, like obviously you don't make decisions willy-nilly, right? Like I would say when in deciding who you're going to marry – really think about that right use a lot of wisdom there you know but things like jobs cars schools things like that these are decisions that um they have consequences right and you just have to use the wisdom that you have to make the right choices okay that's that's enough on that bunny trail um and first corinthians chapter 9 verse 16 it says, for I, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I'm under compulsion, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So again, this kind of uh, is this reminder of you have to stay humble. You have to remember that you're all in the bottom row, right? Um, because there's nothing to boast about in and of ourselves. When all we're doing is preaching the gospel, which has been given to us by God, then there's nothing for us to boast about. We are slaves to Christ, and therefore we must preach the gospel, and woe to us if we preach anything other than the gospel. 
uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 tells us that, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness, for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death. So what is this painting a picture of? This is what ministry looks like, guys. Those of you who are so eager to get into it. And it is this. Commending ourselves as servants of God, endurance, afflictions, hardships, distress, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labor, sleeplessness, hunger, purity, knowledge, patience, kindness. You have the Holy Spirit through all of it. Praise the Lord. Uh, genuine love, the word of truth, power of God, uh, the weapons of righteousness. You have glory and dishonor. You have evil report. You have good report. Uh, you have, you're regarded as deceivers, but you're telling the truth, right? You're unknown yet well-known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death and so this again this is a continual reminder of ministry and, and being a christian and, and living a christian life is it's a lowly position oh i wasn't done yet as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing yet possessing all things right and so it, it's just kind of like right creating these two these dichotomies right of, you know, you're, you'll be poor, you'll be rich, you'll be as you're dying, but yet you still live, and all these kinds of things. He's like, there's nothing, like, if you're looking to ministry as this, like, improvement on your life, as this raise in your status, you got the wrong idea. It's just living. It's just living and preaching the gospel. That's what it is, you know? Um, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, oh, hold on, sorry. <laughs> We're lowly servants, we're slaves of Christ, right? And none of it is to our glory. Uh, and none of it is to our glory or for us to boast in. And yet, right, yet in all of this, right, we have this amazing task, and it's this. So first, we need to recognize that we are servants, slaves, you know, bottom rowers, right? Bottom row, rowing the ship. And we are stewards of the mysteries of God. And I, I love the wording of this, being a steward of the mystery of God. Now, the word steward here is oikonomos, which is uh, like a compound word. So oikos is house and nemo is to manage, right? So you're a house manager. Uh, I like the way that MacArthur explains this. John MacArthur says that all Christians are God's stewards. God has deposited in us his resources, given us spiritual gifts, given us his information, his truth, and we are to share it. We are to minister it to his house, right? So when we are stewards of the word of God, we are managers of the house of God, managers of the word of God. And so stewards of these mysteries that we read about in, in the verse. And so the mysteries of God refers to the things that were hidden, but have now been revealed. And Paul has touched on them throughout 1 Corinthians. We, we've, we've gone through this uh, in, in previous weeks, but... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 says, But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom of God, uh, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Right? Um, 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 10, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. And so these mysteries are these things that uh, are alluded to in John 1, 17. John writes, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So you have the, the old covenant and these mysteries, this mystery of the grace and truth that is Jesus Christ. And so we are stewards of the mysteries of God. That just means we are stewards of the gospel, of the word of God. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we should all know this verse. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, and so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every 
good work. And so what have we been tasked with? We've been tasked with teaching and sharing God's word, but sharing God's word in truth. Uh, Therefore, since we have the mystery of the... Oh, okay. This is actually... So if you guys are writing notes down, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. This isn't 2 Timothy. This is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore... Since we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So what this is telling us, right? And so again, remember, all scripture is inspired by God, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, for training in righteousness, right? It is our job to be stewards of of the word of God. And so right here it says, um, we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, meaning just because something is hard to teach or there's something written in scripture that we think would, you know, hurt someone's feelings, we don't avoid those texts, right? We don't use the Bible as a proof text for our opinions, right? We don't form an opinion and then find verses that fit that opinion and then preach that way. Now, we shape our opinions after what the Word of God is teaching us, right? The Scripture is our authority. So again, we cannot treat the Bible as a proof text for our opinion. Rather, our opinions are to be formed after the Word of God. And so, what we've been given also, right, as stewards of the mysteries of God, the Word of God, we've also been given the church, which is the bride of Christ, uh, to care and to steward for. And so um, I want us to take a look at this about a five minute clip of Paul Washer kind of um, speaking in the way that only Paul Washer can about our approach to the church, to the bride of Christ. His love for the church. It it shows him to be a husband to a bride and a father to children. That's what we see in this. Now, I have a wife, and she is beautiful, and I love her very much. And I have children, and I love them very, very much. You see, there were times my wife would go with me anywhere when we were missionaries in South America. I mean, she'd walk into danger, no problem. But there were times when I would go into certain military zones where I knew they're going to pull me off the bus, they're going to rough me up a little bit, they're going to push me around, they're going to try to show their authority. And when they do that to me, that's fine. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. That doesn't bother me a bit. But if one of them laid one finger upon my wife, well, that's quite another story, isn't it? I want you to think about this, pastors. Think about this. There was a great king who loved his bride. Oh, he loved her. And he always dressed her in the simplest yet most elegant white linen. She needed no audacious colors on her face. She needed no wild hairdos. She was beautiful, simple, elegant, pure, godly, beautiful. One day this king goes on a long journey and he calls you as a steward. He says, I'm going to entrust my bride to you. I'm going to be going. I've laid out for you in a book every rule I want you to maintain. I want nothing changed, nothing changed. Steward, you be faithful to carry out this book. Well, the king goes and he's been away a long time long time and all of a sudden the steward begins to realize that the people in the kingdom are are no they're losing interest in the king because they're losing interest in the bride she's too simple um too prudish rather boring she's out of step with the times and so this steward thinks in his mind aha 
I've got it figured out. He calls her in. He takes off her white, elegant, godly dress and dresses her in something far more attractive to carnal men. Paints her face and then parades her up and down the street and by doing so draws all the carnal wicked men back into fellowship supposedly with the king. That's exactly what countless pastors in America are doing today. They have taken the simplicity of the bride of Christ, her magnificent beauty, her purity, her holiness, and they have tore it from her and they dress her up and parade her in front of carnal men that they will be attracted to somehow come back to God. Let me tell you something. On the day of judgment, don't, don't worry about the atheist. Don't fear for the prostitute or the murderer. You want to fear for somebody on the day of judgment? You fear for a large number of evangelical pastors who have departed from the word of God and are parading the church in a dress, a garb that God never intended her to wear. Many times I pray, Lord, increase your fear in me. Increase your fear in me. You should be afraid to touch my wife. Terribly afraid. Oh, but how much more afraid should you be to touch the bride of Christ? and do anything with her that is not found in this book. To minister, right, is to be humble. It's to be a slave to Christ. It's to steward his word, and it's to care for his bride, right? And so, you know, what that looks like, right? We've been given, again, we've been given everything that is required of us and what God expects us to do is already written in his word. And this is why we hold it to the highest authority. This is why there's so many churches that make the mistake of using business strategies to grow their congregations rather than just doing what God has told us to do. And so you have sanctu sanctuaries, massive buildings filled to the brim with people who are going to hell. And they're not worshiping God in the in the manner that he has commanded us to worship him, right? And so, and, and it's, it's veering from the gospel because when you start preaching the gospel, you notice that uh, numbers tend to get smaller when you start preaching from the word of God, you know, and preach, you know, because I, I know people say all the time, you know, but but these are the people, you know, this is the only time they're going to hear the gospel. And, you know, I wish it were the case. They're not hearing the gospel. They're hearing these, you know, moral therapeutic positive messages, you know, that they could get from any speaker. You know, you can go to some conference that your job hosts and hear about how you know, how to change your mentality and start thinking more positively, you know, and don't beat yourself up and all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, you need to hear about sin and repentance and the price that Christ had paid. And so, again, to minister is to be humble, to be a slave to Christ, to steward his word, to care for his bride, and in all of this, to be uh, trustworthy. So, verse 2, it says, In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. And so this is where a lot of people will fall short here is because there's a ton of ministers, right? Who have intelligence, but no integrity, right? It's easy to be a Christian in church, right? It's easy to be a really good Christian here in this setting. But when you get the group small enough, right? And the group around you, it's, it's, it's just you and your little crew, right? 
Like, how do you speak in that situation? How do you talk? What's your attitude like? What are the things that you talk about? Do you still discuss the things of God? Do you still th- discuss Christ, or is it all kind of like casual, just hangout chatter, right? You know, just pop culture references, and then that's it, right? And here's the thing, right? It's not, right, our dialogue shouldn't be Christ 24-7, although it wouldn't hurt, but, right, like, not, none of us are going to do that, Right? But can we be stewards in a trustworthy manner, right? Are we doing anything that's going to harm our testimonies, right? When the the group gets small enough, right? When you're in a particular setting, I'm just asking you, pay attention to who you are in those moments and in that time. How do you talk? How do you act? Do you complain a little too much? You know, are you a little bit too sarcastic? Things like that, right? I'm not talking to myself, right? Right? But again, it's, it's not only being humble, being a servant, and, and you're stewarding. You can't just be a steward. You have to be a trustworthy steward. And that has been the downfall of a lot of major churches here in America, is that you have all these quote-unquote pastors who have had zero integrity, right? One of the biggest issues, right? Um, so what we tend to do, right, is we find a good, you know, charismatic leader, uh, I mean, charismatic in the personality sense, not in the doctrinal sense, right? So, let, let, but um, do you ever think about the fact that the reason for certain people's success, um, their speaking ability, their you know their communication skills, uh, how ambitious they are, and all these kind of, these things that that have led to the success of so many speakers is also the same reason for their downfall because of their ambition, because of their communication skills and all these things, because they have not been refined by the word of God. They have not repented and surrendered their lives to Christ. They've just kind of put on this Christian costume, right? And so again, it's easy to be a Christian in church, but when things are small enough, right, is the, is the fear of God evident in your life? And this is another problem that we tend to have, right? is the reason we're such good Christians in the church setting is because we're afraid of the Christians that we're around. It's not because we're afraid of God, right? We're afraid of how are the church folk going to talk about me? What are they going to say about me, right? Oh, I'm in. I'm on this team or in this leadership. I better behave in front of my leaders. Like, no, you better behave in front of God Almighty, right? We're too scared of people and not scared enough of God, right? We need to fear God. God. And our fear of God is what leads us to be a trustworthy steward. And so to be a minister, again, to be humble, slave of Christ, steward his word, care for his bride, and be trustworthy in all of this. And then Paul says something interesting to kind of follow all of this up. In verse 3, He says, but to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. And this is tough, too, because it's hard to handle God's word or lead worship, right? Or or do whatever form of ministry that you do, like in a church setting, right? It's hard to, to do all that and to do it with fear and trembling and to do it in spirit and truth and not and not think about how others receive it, right? It's just, it's just this weird, you know, it's just this human tendency that we have, right? If you're playing and singing, you want to know, was that was that received well, right? You, you teach a lesson, you spend all these hours in study, and, and you put it out there, you know, you're going to think about, was that received well? Did I do a good enough job? And here you see Paul saying, he says, I don't even examine myself. And so Paul's saying, he's like, I, I kind of don't care. It's a, it's, it's a very small thing what you or anyone else says. I don't even examine myself. I have to admit, right? Like, I have to admit uh, that that, that's tough. That's tough sometimes, right? Because, like, I want to know, like, for me, you know, because I'm a control freak or whatever, like, I like to uh, rewatch a lesson or something like that and go over it and say, did I hit these points correctly and all these kind of stuff? And like, I examine myself and, 
right? There, there is a, I guess there's room for that because we all should strive for excellence and try to improve it in whatever it is that we do, right? But again, it's like, what's, what's the motivation behind why you're examining yourself, right? Are you trying to actually grow or are you, you know, improving in, you know, for humanistic reasons, right? And so it's always good to remind ourselves that, it's God who is awakening dead hearts, and it's not us. Like Paul said, he said, I didn't come to you with wisdom and all this complicated speech. He said, I just preached the gospel. And so, like I say many, many times, guys, because it is the one, it is, it is, it's God who saves. It is God who turns hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And so the pressure is off. The pressure is off of you. You don't have to be persuasive. You don't have to be convincing. It is a work of God on the hearts of people. So all you have to do is preach the word and preach it in truth. And then the will of God is the will of God at that point. And so many times we beat ourselves up, examining ourselves, right? Uh, we ask people, you know, we'll do the fake humble thing, you know, like someone will compliment us. It's like, oh, it wasn't that good, you know? Y'all do that. Y'all know y'all do that, right? Or we try to shrug it off, you know, like, hey, man, that was excellent. You played really well, or you sang well, or you, and that was a really good lesson. Oh, you know, glory to God. Yeah, right. You don't think that. Not in that moment. Right? It's okay. We're human. We're faulty, right? We're all trying to get this. We're all trying to get this right. And th these are the things that we have to work on. These are the things we have to, you know, we, we have to... He says, to me, it's a very small thing that I be examined by you or by anyone else. In fact, I do not even examine myself. Is what, what the point of this is, right? Why would he say something like this? Is that it's because it's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual victory to not care what other people think, okay? So what that means is you are so certain of the truth of the word of God that you present the truth and then you don't care, right? That is a spiritual victory victory that is again the weight is completely off why because it's the truth it's the truth of the word of god it's all in god's hands it's all according to his will so all you have to do is share the truth and then that's it and guess what you stop worrying so much about did i do it right did i do it well do people still like me and all this stuff and and you're you're not going to rate yourself anymore you're not going to compare yourself to anyone else anymore because you're going to present the truth and then you trust that it's all in God's hands because it is all in God's hands, right? And it's his truth. It's like you kind of don't have to do anything. You just say what you're, to, you're supposed to say, you know, and, and God does the rest. God is so gracious. And so it's why it's so crucial for us to not pervert the truth of the word of God. And uh, verse four says, for I'm conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. So Paul is saying nothing really comes to mind as far as like a consistent sin. I'm not doing any false teaching, so I don't fear any human judgment, right? He says, I know what the truth of the word of God is. I'm, I'm living a pretty decent life, right? He's not perfect, but he's like, Nothing really comes to mind. Uh, I'm not conscious of anything against myself. Uh, and he goes, so I'm just preaching. I'm preaching the word of God. He goes, but ultimately, I'm not the judge and you're not the judge. God is the judge, right? He says, I'm not acquitted by this. Even though my conscience is clear and I'm presenting the truth, he's like, this doesn't let me off the hook. He says, the one who examines me is the Lord, Right, which again, our problem is we fear people more than we fear God. And so we're so worried about comments and criticism and compliments from humans that we forget, like, would God approve of what the message that I taught? Would God approve of the worship that I brought forth? Right? And so this is why we stay accountable and live lives of repentance because we are held by God's standard and not man's standard. And what is God's standard? Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 5, 48, Therefore you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
This is God's standard. God's standard is perfection. And you're thinking to yourself, well, that is impossible. And you are absolutely correct. It is impossible. We cannot live perfect lives. But guess who did? Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We talk about this all the time. This is double imputation, right? We cannot live perfect lives, but that is what is required of us if we are to be in fellowship with our Father. So what happened? God the Son came down and lived that perfect life. And it's not that we just put our sin onto him, which that did happen. Those of us who are saved, we have been purchased with blood, the blood of Christ. But that's not all that happened. There's an exchange there. What do we get in return? The righteousness of Christ. To be viewed as perfect, holy, and blameless when we stand before God. Right? And we've been purchased with his blood. Acts 20, 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. We have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So we are to be humble slaves, faithful and trustworthy stewards of the word of God and of the bride of Christ, and we are to hold ourselves to God's holy and righteous standard. And we have to remember to stay humble. Verse 5, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. And so Paul is saying to stop judging and evaluating so much, right? We already covered when it's okay, when there is false teaching and when there is consistent sin or a lifestyle of sin, right? But stop judging and evaluation so much because remember, remember, we're all sinners, right? We're all in the middle of our own sanctification. We're all going to need grace at some point in our lives, right? We're all going to want grace. So, so before you drop the hammer on someone, just think about yourself in their position. You're going to want some grace in that moment, right? And, and we often get too eager, right? And I think it's well-intentioned, right? Because we're very passionate about what we believe, we're often a little too eager to kind of like drop drop it down on someone, you know, like like I don't know, like I guess discipline. We want to discipline people. We're a little too eager for that. And just think, just think for a second. You know, aren't you gonna want a little bit of grace from your brothers and sisters from time to time? Right? And that's kind of how we have to approach things. He says, Did, don't go on passing judgment before the time. We're all you know, we're all working on our own sanctification, and you, everyone's got to remember, we're all on the bottom row, guys. And so, this verse here is actually in line with uh, some of the verses that we've looked at in previous weeks. And so, let's let's take a look at a couple of them. So, 1 Corinthians 2.11, For who among men knows the thoughts of man, except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. And so, again, when it comes to judging someone, their motivations or whatever, right, you don't really know the thoughts and motivations of anyone. You really don't know, right? And so, only I know what I'm really thinking, and only you know what you're really thinking, right? And God knows all, and God will reveal all. So, at the end of all things, right, and, and you know, the ones who, you know, were teaching false things or um, people who on the surface seemed like good, humble Christians, but their motivations were selfish from the get-go, that will all be revealed in the end of all things, right? And so, yeah, we, like, um, I'm reminded of 
there's a, a particular teacher who had a lot of very problematic teachings, and um, there's a discussion between uh, two pastors who thought one way and two pastors who thought a, a different way. And this guy had come up in the conversation. They said, do you think so-and-so is a false teacher? And, uh, you know, the guys were like, yeah, he has some very problematic things. Here's this, this, and that. And one of them, this was like his best friend. And he goes, he goes, I know that man to the depths of his soul. Turns out that guy didn't, right? The, the man in question, the teacher in question, was a very, very sick, twisted, perverted individual. And here he is, friends with someone for 30 plus years, right? Like, this is not like a, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but like, you really don't know people. Not to the depths of who they actually are, right? And so, you know, that's just... You just got to keep that in mind that all things will be revealed by Christ at the end. But um, we read this a few weeks ago. First uh, Corinthians 3.13, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is, so, uh, it is to be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on, on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. So over here, I underline the word the day. And so the day that we're talking about is what we just read in 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Uh, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. And so, again, I to not get into this like super, super deep, my, what I recommend for you guys to do is go back and rewatch our lesson on chapter 3, verses 10 through 17, uh, where Paul kind of starts the thought that connects to this verse about men who build with uh, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, and then it's all tested by fire. And so the day here is the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness to disclose the motives of men's hearts, right? And so another reason that we know that chapter 3, 1 Corinthians, isn't about the fictional purgatory is because this verse here kind of concludes that thought. And so it's talking about the day of the return of the Lord and not some other period of time, right? And like I said, I'd recommend going back, listen to chapter 3, verse 10 through 17. We did that lesson two weeks ago, I think. Um, and just f real quick, right? So we have a better understanding of death, heaven, and the day of judgment. So I'll be really, really brief. If you want more uh, information on that, I would say revisit that lesson. But in brief, heaven is this intermediary time. And Judgment Day happens at the return of Christ. So everyone who dies, who has died and will die before the return of Christ is in this intermediary period of heaven. We don't have a whole lot of clear pictures of what heaven actually is. We do have some extensive verses on what the Day of Judgment is. But the Day of Judgment happens at the return of Christ. If you're ever confused, right, about well, I thought if I die and I get to heaven, there's no more sickness, pain, or any of that other stuff. So what's all this judgment stuff, right? These are two different periods of time. And I think a lot of Christians conflate the two. And so just understand there is a distinction of heaven and the intermediary time of heaven and judgment day and the kingdom that comes as a result of the return of Christ. So it's at judgment day when, man, when men's true motives will be revealed and each will receive their due reward. And that's what we read here. Disclose the motives of men's heart, then each man's praise will come to him from God. So if you built with gold, silver, precious stones, then you will receive your reward. And Revelation twenty two twelve gives us another picture of this. Is Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Right. And so until then, until then, we stay humble. We are a faithful slave of Christ. We are to take care of his bride. 
We are to be trustworthy with her. We are to steward God's word well. And we are to live according to God's standard and not man's standard. And remember that God is the ultimate judge. So let's approach each other with grace and with humility. And remember, we're all bottom rowers and we're all trying to conform to the image of Christ. Amen.